When it became clear that the cost of building the Sydney Opera House would go well over budget, the New South Wales government set up public lotteries to help fund the project. One of these lotteries had far-reaching consequences that nobody could have predicted, including changes to laws and increased prominence of forensic policing. Above all else, an innocent young boy would have his life needlessly taken from him. This is the story of Graham Thorne's kidnapping and murder. As travelling salesman Basil Thorne stepped off his plane at Sydney Airport on the 1st of June 1960, he was greeted by a small group of reporters. He had just won £100,000 in the Opera House lottery and they were keen to get a picture of him put on the front page of their newspaper. His home address was also published, as were details about his family, his wife Frida and their children Belinda and Graham. The Thorns would have to wait a few weeks to receive their prize money, so they didn't start a spending spree. Basil and Frida did agree on one indulgence though, a new phone for their rented Bondi flat. Before the phone had been connected, the Thorns received an unusual visit from a man with a European accent who told them he was a private investigator. He was looking for a Mr Bogner and asked Frieda to confirm the phone number he had in his records. Frieda told the man it was the correct number, but their phone hadn't been connected yet. She knew nobody named Bogner and suggested he ask their upstairs neighbour. Though the man left the apartment, Frieda felt unsettled by the encounter. Life went on as usual for the Thorne family. Basil still travelled for work, Frieda tended to their children while he was away, and their son Graham continued to go into school at Scots College. Every morning, Graham would leave home to make the short walk to a corner store, where he would buy something to eat and wait for his mother's friend Phyllis to pick him up and drive him to school. When Phyllis went to their usual meeting spot one Thursday morning, Graham was nowhere to be seen. Phyllis told Frida, who realised something was wrong and reported Graham missing. A police officer went to Frida's home and started to get Graham's details when the phone rang. The man on the other line told Frida that he had her son and wanted to speak to her husband, so she gave the phone to the police officer. The kidnapper demanded £20,000 in ransom money for Graham's safe return, or Graham would be fed to the sharks. Frida's worst nightmare had become a reality. Her son had been kidnapped. By the time Basil returned from work, a police operation was already underway to find Graham. The Thorns phone was monitored in anticipation of more calls from the kidnapper, and transit points around the country were given Graham's description. Ground patrols also asked around the streets of Bondi for anyone that may have seen anything suspicious that morning. The Thorns told police of their strange visitor from a few weeks earlier. Frida was sure that the man's voice was identical to the ransom caller. The kidnapper called again later that evening and gave further instructions for the ransom money, but hung up before police could get all the details or trace the call. The Thorns then went to Bondi Police Station, where Basil appeared on TV to plead for Graham's safe return. The person that's got him, if he's a father and got children of his own, well, for God's sake, send him back in one piece. <laughs> After Basil's appeal, media and public interest in Graham's disappearance intensified. The New South Wales Government, Sydney Morning Herald and Daily Telegraph offered a combined £20,000 reward for any information leading to the capture of the kidnapper. Police worked around the clock to search for Graham and manage the deluge of tips they received. Most callers genuinely wanted to help, though some pretended to be the kidnapper in an attempt to secure the ransom money themselves. Police focused on two pieces of information in their efforts to locate the kidnapper the man who visited the Thorns weeks earlier and a blue Ford custom line seen in the area of the abduction. Witnesses described the driver as a man with dark hair, bushy eyebrows and a European complexion. A similar man was reportedly seen at a park near the Thorn house just days before Graham's disappearance. 
Based on this information, police attempted to interview every owner of a Blue Ford Custom Line in New South Wales, but uncovered no new leads. Almost six weeks after the kidnapping, a group of children playing in a vacant lot at Seaforth spotted what they thought was a skeleton wrapped in a blanket. The children told their parents, who quickly realised they were looking at a dead body, and contacted police. Graham had been found. Though the discovery of Graham's body was an outcome nobody wished for, it gave police crucial evidence that helped bring his killer to justice. A post-mortem examination of Graham found signs of a skull fracture and oxygen deprivation, both of which may have led to its death. Graham's clothes and the blanket he was found in were thoroughly inspected. His tie, coat and pockets were all as they had been the morning he said goodbye to his mother, which suggested he died within 24 hours of his abduction. Mould had also begun to grow on the soles of Graham's shoes, which indicated he hadn't walked in them for several weeks before his body was found. Both dog and human hairs were found on the blanket Graham was wrapped in. Some of the human hair had been treated with a red henna rinse. Scientists also found fragments of pink mortar, which was distributed along Graham's back. Police began to theorise that his body may have been laid down and hidden away before being dumped. Plant matter was also found within the blanket, which was analysed by botanists. They discovered that it came from two different kinds of cypress, though there were no cypress trees where Graham's body was found. The botanists concluded that the odds of the two different kinds of cypress growing in the same spot were extremely rare, which could help narrow the police search for Graham's killer. With a profile of the kidnapper building, police began searching suburbs near where Graham's body was found for a house containing pink mortar and two different varieties of cypress. Eventually, a postman notified police that he had seen a home on his route that matched their description in Clontarf. Police learned that the home's previous occupant was named Stephen Bradley. A Hungarian immigrant, Bradley had moved out to Clontarf with his wife and children on the very day that Graham had disappeared. The family then briefly lived at a house in Manly before vacating it as well. Bradley also owned a Blue Ford Custom Line, which he sold after Graham disappeared. Police actually talked to Bradley earlier when investigating Blue Ford Custom Line owners but found nothing suspicious about him. The car was located and examined. Inside were dog and human heads that matched those found with Graham's body, including some dyed red. The officers eventually learned that the red hairs likely belonged to Bradley's wife Magda, while the dog hairs were those of their pet, a Pekingese named Cherie. A further investigation of the garage at Clontarf uncovered torn threads that matched the blanket Graham had been wrapped in. On top of this, a roll of discarded film was found outside the Manly house. After it was developed, it revealed photos of Bradley's family sitting on a blanket, identical to the one Graham was found in. Finally, police showed Stephen Bradley's photo to Frida and Basil Thorne. Both of them identified Bradley as the man who had visited their home weeks before Graham's kidnapping. With the physical evidence, witness accounts and a positive identification by the Fawns, police had finally found the man responsible for Graham's kidnapping and murder. In the months after he kidnapped and killed Graham, Stephen Bradley made plans for himself and his family to migrate to England on an ocean liner. Bradley told his wife and children that the move would give them a new start, though his true motive was to evade police. When their ship reached their first international stopover in Colombo, police arrested Bradley and charged him with murder. After several weeks of legal wrangling, authorities extradited Bradley to Australia under a heavy police guard. During his interviews with police in Sydney, Bradley admitted his involvement in Grant's kidnapping and death. The police then asked Bradley for a written confession, describing his version of events. In his confession, Bradley told of how he planned to kidnap Graham after seeing news of Basil Thorne's Opera House Lottery win in the newspaper. He observed Graham's morning routine and was able to lure Graham into his car by telling him that Phyllis was sick that day. Bradley then drove to a public phone near the Spit Bridge to make the ransom call before taking Graham to his garage at Clontarf. 
Bradley then gagged Graham and placed him in his car boot, and when he checked on him later that night, the boy was dead. Bradley discarded Graham's belongings near Bantry Bay before dumping his body in the vacant lot at Seaforth. According to Bradley's confession, he hadn't meant to kill Graham. The child's death was a complete accident. When Bradley went on trial for Graham's kidnapping and death, he completely reversed his position and pleaded not guilty. Bradley told the court that his early confession had been coerced out of him by police, who threatened to make life difficult for his wife and children. Frida Fawn testified that Bradley had been the man who had visited her home, whom she later identified in police photos. When Bradley's defence lawyer tried to rebuff her testimony, Frida pointed and shouted towards Bradley that he was the man who killed her boy. Scientists demonstrated that it would have been impossible for anyone to die of suffocation alone in the car boot, as Bradley had claimed in his confession. A forensic pathologist also gave evidence and stated Graham's skull fracture could have only been caused by deliberate force and was no accident. The prosecution closing address argued that evidence against Bradley was overwhelming, and even the early confession by Bradley was an attempt to contort the narrative of Graham's death to his advantage. The jurors agreed with the prosecution and found Stephen Bradley guilty of murder. Bradley was sentenced to life in prison, where he died of a heart attack at age 42. The murder of Graham Thorne caused a significant shift in Australian policing and laws. It showed how forensic science could be used against criminals instead of relying on boots to the ground police work alone. The clothes, blanket, hairs, mortar and plant matter combined helped indicate Graham's time of death and connect him to his killer. Kidnapping for ransom was so unprecedented in Australia that there were no laws against it in New South Wales at the time. After Graham's abduction, the law was changed to make kidnapping for ransom a capital offence with harsh penalties. The case also brought about changes to the reporting of lottery wins in Australia. Instead of having their names and addresses splash across newspapers and TV screens, winners could opt to remain completely anonymous. Even today, the case demonstrates how powerful information can be and the importance of privacy in a continually public world. Regardless of how compelling it is to hear these changes, the reasons they came about should be remembered above everything else. An innocent young child lost their life due to selfishness and greed. We can only hope that Graham's story is never repeated. Rest in peace, Graham.